Hi, I'm Tom Newman. I'm a professor emeritus of epidemiology and biostatistics and pediatrics, and I'm going to talk about uh, dichotomous diagnostic tests, a lecture we call Prediction One. And uh, I want to make sure you all know that uh, our book, uh, written by Michael Cohn and me, Evidence-Based Diagnosis, uh, second edition just came out in 2020, and you can download the whole book, PDFs of every chapter, uh, as a zip file from the UCSF library for free. All you have to do, I have some screenshots here, uh, just type Newman and Cohn in the search box. The second uh, entry here, make sure you get the second edition. If you click on that, uh, this will come up and you can see uh, it's restricted to use, either one of these will work, but you see campuses or UCSF. If you click on that, it will take it you to the Cambridge University Press website and you should get this green check mark that says access, which means you have access to it. And if you just scroll down the page a little, you can see you can download a chapter at a time, or if you click right here, download PDF, zip all the chapters together, and uh, that's free. That's the deal that Cambridge made with UC, and I think it's wonderful. So I can plug the book without a conflict of interest. But if you wanna buy it, you should know that I'm donating 100% of my royalties to Physicians for Social Responsibility to Support Nuclear Disarmament. And you should know the latest news is that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which was started by international physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW, enters into force when 50 nations ratify it. And Tuvalu became the 47th nation to ratify on October 12, 2020. So we are getting close. And then the next step will be to get the nuclear weapons states to uh, follow the law and abide by it. Okay, end of that digression. Uh, learning objectives for this lecture are to explain why a critical approach to diagnostic tests is important, to review some definitions and usage, prediction, diagnosis, sensitivity, specificity, prior and post year probability, predictive value, accuracy, and likelihood ratios. Uh, we'll draw an important distinction between case control and cross sectional sampling and calculate post-test probability two ways. First, uh, the easiest to understand and slowest way using a two by two table and then using likelihood ratios for which we'll need to learn how to interconvert probability and odds. And then if there's time, uh, we'll talk about false negative confusion. Okay, um, importance of a critical approach. Um, so the first thing is, which I hope to illustrate is that our intuition about interpretation of test results is often wrong. We um, don't take sufficient account of prior probability when interpreting results. And I'll, I may be able to illustrate that for you. And then of course, it's because tests can cause harm. You know, They cost money and pain, discomfort, or complications, depending on how invasive the test is. And they can give wrong answers, which then lead to misdiagnoses in the case of false negatives or unnecessary additional tests or treatments in the case of false positives. And unfortunately, there are many reasons for excessive testing. If you uh, download our book and read chapter six, which is about screening tests, where this is a particular problem, you can find out more, but I'll just show a few images here. Um, this uh, was sent to me, uh, Ameriscan was promoting uh, scans, a free head scan when you purchase a full body scan. Half, so it's almost like a pizza coupon, half price head scan, with the purchase of a full body scan. And um, uh, a company who's marketing this just came to Redwood City this year, Prenuvo Pre is uh, marketing uh, MRIs and uh, their advertisement says Prenuvo is whole body MRI screening on steroids. Uh, that ad didn't really do it for me because I'm thinking immunosuppression, osteoporosis, diabetes, cataracts, psychosis, but um, I think the idea is that they can detect all kinds of stuff. And the is absolutely right. They will definitely detect all kinds of stuff, most of which will be false positives and lead you down a path of getting a bunch of additional tests and expenses and grief. Okay, moving on to definitions. Uh, this is a famous aphorism, not sure where it came from. Prediction is difficult 
especially about the future. And that's been attributed to uh, as either a Danish proverb or to Niels Bohr, Yogi Berra, Mark Twain, many others. And the, the link there will show you the whole attempt to figure out where that quote came from. Thanks to Michael Cohn for that. Okay, well, in ep the reason why I show that is because in epidemiology and biostatistics, prediction isn't necessarily about the future. And this especially is with the machine learning folks. Prediction is using currently available data to estimate either the risk of a future outcome or the probability of an existing condition. And prediction is distinguished from research aimed at estimating causal effects, which you've learned about already. So the whole issue of confounders, right? If your only goal is prediction, you're not worried about causality. In fact, the causality, when we're talking about diagnosing disease, really goes the other way because the disease causes the findings, the signs and symptoms that we're gonna look at. And so we're not worried about confounding, we're just worried about how accurate the prediction is. Uh, next definition is dichotomous tests. Uh, those are tests that have only two results and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And then uh, when Michael Cohn talks about prediction two, um, he'll, talk, he'll talk about multi-level tests and continuous tests that can have um, many more than two results. And here's an example of a dichotomous test. This uh, has been in the news. Uh, this is the um, uh, COVID test uh, for, uh, uh, by Abbott Labs, their, their Binax test. It costs about $5 and it gives a quick result. And uh, that's the test we're gonna be talking about later for when we do the two by two table example. But for now, we're still doing definitions so uh, our next two definitions oops, um, are sensitivity and specificity. And the sensitivity, specificity, and then accuracy and predictive value, positive, negative predictive value, these are all uh, parameters that measure how often the test gives the right answer. So we want all of them to be as close as possible to 100% because that would make a good test. Sensitivity and specificity, measure how often the test gives the right answer in those who have the disease, that sensitivity uh, in this two by two table, it would be A over A plus C. And you can remember uh, sensitivity with a mnemonic PID, positive in disease. And PID also stands for pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a disease which requires a lot of sensitivity to deal with. So sensitivity, how often does the test give the right answer in those who have the disease? And specificity is how often does the test give the right answer in those who don't have the disease. And so in this case, the right answer would be for the test to be negative. And the mnemonic for that is uh, NIH, negative in health. Uh, the NIH is very, very specific about how they want their grant proposals. If you um, have your margins too wide or your font too small, they'll just send it right back to you uh, without reviewing it. So sensitivity, PID, positive in disease, na specificity, NIH, negative in health. And notice that when we're doing sensitivity and specificity, if we make our two by two table this way with disease on top, test on the side that we're going vertically up and down, okay? Continuing with definitions, the pretest probability or the prior probability, that's what percent have the disease in a population. So that would be A plus C, those are the numbers that have the disease, uh, over A plus B plus C plus D. But that is only, you can only do that if the sampling is what we call cross-sectional. So we need to just digress a little bit and say, when will A plus C over the total be the pretest probability? And uh, the answer is if subjects are either randomly sampled from a population or consecutively, so that the proportion with the disease, the pretest probability or the prevalence is clinically meaningful. And that would be uh, different. We're gonna come in a little bit to case control sampling where we choose what percent uh, in, our, in our study will have the disease. Okay, more definitions, accuracy. Accuracy is the percent of time the test gives the right answer 
in a population. So that would be going along the diagonal, A plus D over uh, A plus B plus C plus D or A plus D over N. And if the sampling is not cross-sectional, then what we need to do is take a weighted average of the sensitivity and specificity weighted by the prior probability of disease. Okay, so I'm gonna do a demonstration now of a screen for COVID with 99.9% .9 accuracy. And normally I would do this live in class, but um, I'm socially <laughs> isolated here. So the only subject I can do that on is uh, my wife, Johanna. So I'm gonna pause the recording and go get Johanna. Uh, okay, um, Johanna is here. Uh, and my test for COVID, it used to be that I would like put my hand on somebody's head, but just uh, to show that I can do this with social distancing, what I do is I put on this special hat that allows me to tell who has COVID. Um, I'm not getting to wear this for Halloween, so I'm wearing it now. Okay, Johanna. Johanna is wearing what she wears if she takes a, a walk through the neighborhood. Uh, Johanna is very worried about COVID. And because of that, so yeah, she has, she has her N95 mask with a valve, but then she also has a paper mask because she doesn't want the neighbors to think she's inconsiderate and wearing a valved mask. So Johanna has a very, very low <laughs> prior probability of COVID. Um, and I'm going to tell whether she has it or not with a test with 99.9 .9 plus percent accuracy. You don't have it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Johanna. Um, okay. So the point here is that if the prior probability is low or very, very low, say one in a thousand or less, then a test where I just always say negative, it will be right 99.9 .9 plus percent of the time. So it will have high accuracy. So in this case, the specificity is 100% and it would get weighted 99.9%. Okay, so that was our, our demonstration of accuracy and also negative predictive value. So both accuracy and negative predictive value will look really, really good for any test that has um, uh, a low prior probability or low prevalence if it's measured in a low prior probability population. Okay, so additional definitions, positive and negative predictive value, so once again, these are um, estimates of how often the test gives the right answer. Um, but now we're going horizontally. So positive predictive value is A over A plus B. It's among those who test positive, what percent did the test give the right answer? So that would be the true positives or the percent that have the disease over the total positives. And the negative predictive value is the probability of a correct answer in those who test negative. So once again, going horizontally, only this now would be D over C plus D because the correct answer, uh, if you don't have the disease, is for the test to be negative. Now, an important thing about uh, uh, these is sometimes people will estimate positive and negative predictive value in a population that doesn't have an actual realistic prevalence of the disease. And that can come up if uh, the investigators have done what we call case control sampling where cases with disease and controls without the disease are sampled separately. And in that case, the proportion with the disease is determined by the investigator. So if the investigator chooses to study 100 subjects with the disease and 100 subjects without the disease, then the sort of pseudo prevalence in that study will be 50%. And then the positive predictive value will be way higher than it would have been if, if you actually tried to calculate it. If you went uh, horizontally, like I showed before, the positive predictive value would be the, what positive predictive value you would get in a population with 50% prevalence. But such a population is completely artificial. It just exists because the investigator chose to sample 100 cases and 100 controls. So, when you've done this kind of case control sampling, you can't do this uh, pretest probability is A plus C over the total, and you can't do positive predictive value, and you can't do negative predictive value. 
All right, uh, additional definitions. So prevalence and pretest probability, very similar. The prevalence is the proportion with the disease at one point in time. Uh, it's distinguished from incidence, which is the percent who get the disease over a period of time or an incidence rate, right? Uh, cases per 100 to 1,000 person years. Uh, so it's typically measured in populations. If we're doing screening tests, that is mean we're just testing people without any regard to their signs or symptoms or risk factors, then the pretest probability would often be the prevalence because you don't know any more about the patients than the population they're from. But when we're doing diagnostic tests, we're in a clinical situation where uh, someone comes to you with a chief complaint and they have some signs and symptoms, the pretest probability before we do a diagnostic test incorporates the history and physical exam findings. So it could be after the history and physical, you think it's pretty likely that the person has the disease, in which case their pretest probability would be a lot higher than just the prevalence of that disease in the population. So more definitions, post-test probability versus predictive value. So the post-test probability after a positive test is the same as positive predictive value. It's the same, but Post-test probability is a more general term because not all tests are dichotomous. They're not all just positive or negative. And uh, you'll, but post-test probability can occur for and exist for any result. And the post-test probability after a negative test is one minus negative predictive value. Because of course, the post-test probability is the chance that they have it. And negative predictive value is the chance that they don't have it, remember, because uh, it's the percent of time the test gave the right answer, and the right answer if the test is negative is that they don't have the disease. Okay, so that's it for the definitions. Let's go on to the two by two table method for obtaining posterior probability. So we're going to come back to this uh, um, Binax malaria test. Um, we're gonna assume that the sensitivity is 95%. I have a reference down there uh, just from a uh, news article from October 7th. 95%, specificity 98%. These are admittedly kind of at the low end, um, but they illustrate the issue better. Um, it might be a little bit better than that, um, or it might be worse. Anyway, we're gonna use 95%, 98%. And we're gonna assume that this is a low risk population. So asymptomatic, no known contacts, but from a place where there actually is some COVID. So it's not lower than that. We'll just say it's one in a thousand. And the question for you is, if the sensitivity is 95%, specificity is 98%, pretest probability one in a thousand, what is the post-test probability if the test is positive? That is, what is the positive predictive value? And I want you to Pause the recording now, stop, think, estimate the answer, not necessarily like by doing a calculation, but just think about what it might be. Um, and I will maybe mislead you a bit, you know, 95% sensitivity, 98% specificity. You might think that post-test probably would be something in there, right? Because sensitivity is how often the test gives the right answer in people who have the disease and specificity is how often it gives the right answer in people who don't have the disease. And this person either does or does not have the disease. So probably the test will give the right answer somewhere in that 95 to 98% range would be kind of an intuitive thing to think. And uh, you know, 95%, those are all like an A, right? So this seems like a good test, it gets an A. So it should have a predictive value somewhere in there. So now let's see what, oh, I forgot to do my, do 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 that's in case you didn't pause the recording okay um so let's do it so this is a very step-by-step cookbook approach to figuring out the answer to the question i just asked and the first step of this two by two table method is to draw a table like this put disease on the top put test result on the left, put positive, you know, in the upper left for both, okay? So, um, and then, and I'm ke keeping the, the information that you're given at the bottom. So that's step one, draw a table. Step two, put a big number 
in the lower right corner. And I'm putting 100,000 because that's a plenty big number. We need a pretty big number because our prior probability is low and we want numbers to come out even. All right, that was step two. I hope you're with me so far. Step three, get the total N with the disease. So we'll multiply the pretest probability by the total N. So if there are 100,000 and one in 1,000 have COVID-19, then if we tested 100,000 people, we'd expect 100 of them to be to have the disease because that's our one in a thousand pretest probability. Now step three is to say of these hundred people, how many will test positive? And to get that, we'll use the sensitivity, right? Positive disease, sensitivity. So we'll multiply this number here by the sensitivity. And in this case, we'd say out of these hundred who have COVID, we expect 95 of them to test positive. Okay, and then we could subtract to get the uh, false negatives. In this case, that would be five. Okay, and now we're gonna do the same thing to for the column of the people who don't have COVID-19. So we'll subtract 100 from 100,000 to get the N without the disease and we'll get 99,900. Um, this could be a shortcut, but um, we could get uh, use one minus specificity for the false positives. And the reason why I'm doing that is that since the specificity is 98%, one minus specificity is 2%. And just to see that we're in the right ballpark, we expect this is almost 100,000. So we expect this to be almost 2% of 100,000. And in fact, it's uh, 1998, so very close to that. Uh, we also could have just multiplied uh, 99,900 by 98%, but that's a little bit of a harder math problem to do in your head. We could do that to get this number or we could subtract 1998 from 99,900. Okay, that was step eight. Step nine, get the row total. So we'll add 95 plus 1998 to get 2,093. And we'll add five to uh, 97902 to get uh, 97907. And now we're almost there. Now we can get the post test probability. So if the test is positive, we'll have 95 true positives over 2093 total positives for a positive predictive value of 4.5%. And um, if the test is negative, our negative predictive value will be very close to perfect, 97,902 over 97,907, or um, I'm sorry, this is the post-test probability if the test is negative, which is 0 0.0005. So the negative predictive value would be 99.95%, I think, or 0.995%. Okay, so... Um, uh, now let's interpret, what does that result mean? So if the prior probability is one in a thousand, even if this good test that we gave an A to because the sensitivity was 95% and the specificity was 98% is positive, there's only a 4.5% chance of COVID-19. So uh, that means more than 95% of the positive results will be false positive. And the question is, is this what you guessed? Maybe, if you're, uh, if you're sophisticated. And what happened? Well, what happened is because the prior probability was low, very low, 2%, that's the false positives of a very big number, which was those with no COVID-19, was much bigger than 95%, the true positives of a much smaller number, those who had COVID-19. And so, um, if you um, are wondering, well, what, what was it that I said before that was wrong, where I said that the test gave the right answer 95% of the time in people with the disease and 98% of the time in the people without it? And the answer is, yeah, it almost always gives the right answer, but that's because it's almost always negative. So when it's positive, it often doesn't give the right answer, usually doesn't. Okay. So let's go on to likelihood ratios. So likelihood ratios 
are a ratio of likelihoods or probabilities and um, need to learn some new notation here. So this vertical line means given. So this reads the probability of a result given disease divided by the probability of a result given no disease. So this is a likelihood, the likelihood of getting a particular result given disease over the likelihood of getting that result given no disease. That is what a likelihood ratio is. And you can remember that uh, with the mnemonic with, over, without, right? It's the probability of a certain result with the disease over the probability of that result without the disease. And to help you remember that, one way to remember that is the old Beatles song, Do You, know, Do you Want to Know a Secret? Where they sing, do you want to know a secret? Do you promise not to tell? Whoa, whoa, closer. So the whoa, whoa, right before closer, whoa, whoa, that's with, over, without. Um, and that's a general definition for likelihood ratios that will stand you in good stead for the rest of your medical career. It's true for every test result. It's not just true for dichotomous test results. So that's what a likelihood ratio is. Why do we like likelihood ratios? We like them because they way they can way simplify that rather uh, tedious but straightforward process of using the two by two table method to go from pretest probability to post test probability. But the uh, um, a little complication is that they work with odds, which we'll talk about in a minute. So the pretest odds times the likelihood ratio is equal to the post test odds. Uh, alternate terminology, same prior odds times likelihood ratio is posterior odds. And this works for all tests, not just dichotomous tests, and you, as you'll learn in prediction two. Okay, so you can kind of visualize how likelihood ratios work and how tests work by imagining you have this sort of this scale of probability and you order a test when you're not sure what to do. You know, you're not sure whether to treat the person or reassure them that they don't have it. So you order a test and the test, you know, moves you along the scale to the right if you have a positive test and to the left if you have a negative test. And a good test has long arrows in both directions so it can move you a lot. So the post-test probability of disease depends on two things, where you started from, you know, low, medium, or high risk, and the result of the test, which can be visualized as the length and direction of that result arrow. And one way to summarize this, this is sort of summarizing Bayes' theorem in a non-mathematical way, is what we thought before plus test result equals what we think now. And um, likelihood ratios can range from very low. By low, we mean much less than one. Remember, because we're going to multiply the prior odds to, to by this number. And if it's a number less than one, then the posterior odds will be lower. Um, if the likelihood ratio is very low, it will greatly decrease our probability of disease. If it's kind of low, it'll lower it a little bit. That would be like a short arrow. If the likelihood ratio is one, that means that the result that you got is equally likely among people who do and do not have disease, in which case it gave you no information on the likelihood of disease. If you think about it, if you get a result that's way more common among people who have the disease and you think, hmm, that probably wouldn't happen if they didn't have the disease. That result makes me raise my probability of disease. But a useless test will have a like or a useless result will have a likelihood ratio of one. Um, if the likelihood ratio is more than one, it might increase your probability of disease a little. So likelihood ratios of two are sort of two to five are kind of the range for laws of physical exam findings, things that don't prove you have disease, but might increase the likelihood. And then a very high likelihood ratio for a good test that might be a hundred or a thousand or more. So the advantages I mentioned, like the likelihood ratio simplify the calculation of post-test probabilities. And I say, especially if the disease is rare, because in that case, you can skip the odds step. 
which does kind of slow things down if you're doing this by hand. And the other advantage, uh, again, we'll talk, talk about next week, is they capture inter information from multi-level or continuous test results, not just dichotomous ones. But the disadvantage is if either the pretest or the post-test probability is high, and by high, we mean more than about 10%, you know, um, even if it's 5%, it'll be a little bit off, then you need to use odds or a slide rule or a calculator to, uh, um, to get the right answer. So that leads us to a digression about probability and odds. So when I think the best way to understand odds is with pizzas, so imagine my colleague, Michael Cohen and I, as we're working on the book or on Epi 204, our clinical epidemiology course, decide to share a pizza. I guess we're working on the course because we're grading exams. And uh, it's a vegetarian pizza because uh, we know the carbon footprint from meat, particularly red meat is high. So we don't want to contribute to global warming by eating a pizza with meat. Um, and suppose my share is three times as big as his. Okay, so here's a picture. So the ratio of my share of the pizza to Michael's, at this case, he's just not that hungry and I am, is three to one. So everyone's visualizing this. My share is three times as big as his. And the question is, if my share is three times as big as his, what proportion of the pizza do I get? And you should be able to do this in your head and visualize it and see that if my portion is three times as big as his, then I must get three quarters of the pizza. And that is the difference between probability of odds. So odds is like three to one. My piece is three times as big as his and probability is what proportion of the whole. So similarly, now let's suppose that I'm only gonna eat a fifth of the pizza because I got more than my share last time and I'm not that hungry now. Um, maybe this is our second pizza. So I'm eating a fifth. It's still a vegetarian pizza. And now the question is, what is the ratio of the size of what I eat to what I don't eat or the size of what I don't eat to Michael eats if we, what Michael eats if we finish the pizza? So once again, you probably could do this in your head, right? The whole pizza, we could say, if I get a fifth, then there's four other fifths that I didn't eat. So the ratio is one to four. And in general, in general, the formula for converting from probability to odds is probability over one minus probability is odds. So in this case, 20% over 80%, that's one to four. So technically, mathematically, I wrote this as one colon four, one to four, but mathematically it's one fourth. Right, so um, so when you when you do math with odds, you just treat it as a fraction. Okay, um, so one thing you can notice from this formula is that if p is small, one minus p will be very close to one, and odds and probability will be almost the same. I'll illustrate that in a minute. Okay, the other the other conversion is probability is odds over one plus odds. Or a way that I think is a little bit easier is if the odds are A to B, then probability is A over A plus B. So if odds are one to four, probability is one over four plus one or one plus four or one to five. Uh, okay, but both of these will work. Right, so let's go back to our COVID test, our Binax test. Um, remember the likelihood ratio is the probability of result given disease over the probability of result given no disease. Um, so that would be the probability of a, po if, if it were positive, the test result were positive, the, the Binax test were positive, then it's the probability of a positive test given COVID divided by the probability of a positive test given no COVID. Okay, well, this numerator should look familiar, right? Positive in disease. Hmm. So the numerator here is sensitivity. The denominator is positive in health or positive in no disease. So that's one minus the specificity. So a shortcut method for the positive likelihood ratio is its sensitivity over one minus specificity. So in this case, sensitivity was 95%. 
specificity was 98%, one minus that is 2%. So the likelihood ratio would be 47.5. And remember the pretest odds times the likelihood ratio is the post-test odds. And because these P's are all pretty low, we can ignore the odd step, which means we could just do one in a thousand times 47.5 pretest odds times likelihood ratio is post-test odds. So we get post-test odds of about 4.75%. And because that's low, we could say that's pretty close to the post-test probability. And remember the post-test probability was 4.5%. So that's certainly close enough. Okay, so um, we have um, created a way to visualize likelihood ratios uh, on the website for the book. And uh, I'm gonna just uh, pause the recording and then open up the, a browser and show you that. Okay. Um, I've uh, just opened up a browser and I've gone to ebd-2.net. Uh, our book is illustrated by Martina Storer and uh, she uh, made these, uh, help, help make these figures for the website. Um, okay, so then we're gonna go to the likelihood ratio slide rule, which again, I think allows you to visualize how um, pretest probability and likelihood ratio combined to get post-test probability. So I'm gonna click on that. And then um, we'll enter the pretest probability disease. For our COVID example, that was 0 0.001. Um, for the likelihood ratio of the test result, let's suppose we haven't calculated it. So we'll click on calculate likelihood ratio. And it says, what is the probability of the test result? Remember, the test was positive. What is the probability of a test result R? in a patient with the disease. Well, that was the probability of a positive result in someone with the disease, PID, that was 0.95. And now what is the probability of that result in someone without the disease? That was one minus specificity, the false positive. So that was 0.02. And these questions again work whether or not it's a dichotomous test. So now we'll use this likelihood ratio. And now we'll click on get result. And there probably aren't too many people listening to this who uh, grew up with slide rules. But the idea is if you had a slide rule, you put the one at the pretest probability. And then these are all different potential likelihood ratios. You can see if the likelihood ratio were 10, the post-test probability would be about 10 times higher or 0 0.01. If it were 100, it would be like, close to 0.1, but now we're getting into the whole odds and probability thing where we can't just say that it would be one for a thousand. So if it were a thousand, then the post-test probability would be 0.5. That's because the post-test odds would be one, one to one, right? So post-test probability would be 0 0.5 or a half. So when the odds are one to one or 50-50, the probability is 0.5. And in this case, um, this is the uh, likelihood ratio of 47.5. And if we want the actual, we can see it's a little less than 5% and it, it tells us that it's uh, 0.045. So uh, you can play with this. You can see what would happen if your patient maybe uh, had some symptoms and uh, maybe an exposure and had a pretest probability of COVID of 0.1, how things would change. And the answer is, if the pretest probability were 0.1, now the post-test probability is close to 85%. It's still not 100%. It's still not even 95 to 98%, right? We don't get around there unless our pretest probability is way higher. But certainly 80% would be enough to assume the person had COVID. Let's see what happens when we start with the 50% prior probability. Now we're getting into that 98% post-test probability range. Okay, uh, that's it for the demonstration.
And uh, back to PowerPoint, and it looks like we do have time for the last thing I want to talk about, uh, which is false negative confusion. And um, so um, the sensitivity of, uh, just as an example, the rapid strep test, you probably have all had one of these, is 85%. Therefore, the false negative rate is 15%. And I have a little asterisk there because our students who take epi methods scream in agony when they see this false negative rate being used to refer to a proportion. It's really a false negative proportion, but um, that's what people call it, false negative rate. rate of, if for order for it to be a rate, time would have to be in the denominator. Anyway, that was a digression. Sensitivity, 85%. False negative rate is 15%. A 15% probability of missing strep, that's what a false negative is, is too high. So therefore, I should always culture if the rapid strep test is negative. And this is actually a policy enshrined in the clinical laboratory. Okay. What's wrong with that logic? What's wrong with the logic that this false negative rate of 15% is too high, therefore always do a culture if the strep is negative? Well, uh, here's our two by two table again. This time the disease is strep and uh, the test is this rapid test and we have true positives, false negatives and so on. And here's the trouble. The trouble is that there are two different definitions of the false negative rate, okay? Um, the first definition is, sorry, the first definition is going vertically, okay? Where, so this number, this number here is always a numerator, but in the first definition, the denominator is those who have strep. So it's one minus sensitivity. It's the false negatives over the true positives plus false negatives. And this is the one that's easier for most people to deal with because it's assumed to be constant. It doesn't depend on the pretest probability of strep, okay? But here is the other false negative rate. It's the false negative rate that you get by going horizontally. So it's the false negative rate that is false negatives over all negatives, okay? And it is one minus negative predictive value or false negatives over the total negatives. And this one is harder because it depends on prior probability, but it's the one that should determine clinical decisions. So to illustrate that, let's suppose the prior probability of strep is 20%. That's kind of typical for someone who has a sore throat, <coughs> at least in pediatrics. I'm not sure about adult medicine. And we'll assume this, it's a really very specific test, the rapid strep test, so the specificity is 98%. So then we could go through our, our two by two table exercise, just like we did uh, before with COVID, put a fairly big number here, 500. 20% um, of 500 is 100. 85% of that is 85. That's how we get this. Subtract 100 from 500 to get 400. That's the number with no strep. 2% of them will be false positive. That's eight. 98% um, will be true negative. That's 392. So the false negative rate according to definition two, which is one minus negative predicted value, is only 3.7%. So we said 15% is too high, but in this case, it really would only be 3.7%. So the number needed to culture would be one over that. So you'd have to do 27 throat cultures to identify one false negative rapid strep test if the pretest probability is 20%. So at some prior probability of strep, uh, the culture after a negative rapid strep test uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, and uh, there are lots of examples of this in clinical medicine. Uh, here's another one. People say the sensitivity of a urinalysis or UA for urinary tract infection is only about 85%, therefore always do a culture after a negative urinalysis. I don't know if people are so silly as to do this in adult medicine, but uh, in pediatrics, this is still often said, especially in infants. Um, or the sensitivity of a CT scan for subarachnoid hemorrhage, that's a bleed uh, um, 
uh, inside the head is only 90%. Therefore, always do a lumbar puncture after a negative uh, CT. And um, the same thing comes up uh, when we're talking about, there's also false positive confusion where people mix up one minus specificity with one minus positive predictive value. And that's a mistake that people make when they interpret p-values uh, as being the probability of uh, a type one error, not given the null hypothesis, but overall. But um, that is the topic of another talk. Okay, so that's all just to review. We explained why a critical approach to diagnostic tests is important. Uh, your intuition might not be that good. They cost money and can cause harm. Reviewed all these definitions. Um, sensitivity, specificity, prior and posterior probability, and predictive value and accuracy. These are all things we want to have be close to 100% because they are percents of time the test gives the right answer with various different denominators. Um, we talked about likelihood ratios and whoa, whoa, with over, without. Um, we distinguished between case control and cross-sectional sampling and made the big important point that if you've done case control sampling, you can't estimate predictive value uh, without some outside information on the prior probability. You can't use the study to estimate prior probability. And then we went through how to calculate post-test probability using a two by two table and how to do it using likelihood ratios. Uh, we didn't, and we did some conversion of odds to probabilities uh, and so on. So, and then we did do false negative confusion. So uh, that's it. And um, uh, good luck with uh, your homework set. Bye. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I had one more slide. Oh, I guess I didn't.